A learner inspired Ms. Georgiana Law to teach. Being a teacher inspired her to explore backstage roles to enable faculty to deliver efficient, effective, and engaging learning experiences to their students. These interests are mirrored in the highlights of Georgiana's education, which she has a bachelor's degree in teaching, a master's degree in adult education and distance learning, and she has an OLC certification in, on, in uh, teaching online. In her 10 years of teaching and 10 years of instructional design experience, Ms. Laws has seen education from multiple vantage points, which means the learner, the teacher, the teacher trainer, uh, curriculum designer, instructional designer, team lead, department director, and school board officer. She's also seen this in multiple formats, the face-to-face, -face, the hybrid, and the online. <laughs> Um, primarily the adult learners and in multiple countries such as Europe, Asia, and America. As an instructional designer at Augusta University, uh, which was formerly Georgia, Re Georgia Regents University until uh, recently, Ms. Laws collaborates with faculty members to produce document, um, document lessons, course certificate, and program level uh, designs that meet or exceed the nationally recognized quality standards. So today, Georgiana will speak about learner engagement in e-learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica. I appreciate you. Good Wednesday afternoon, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing today? Would you let me know in the chat box? Oh no, Veronica, we really appreciate you hanging there. Fantastic. Jackie and Michael are doing great. Wonderful. All right. Well, as um, Veronica mentioned, I um, am an instructional designer at Augusta University. Uh, would you please let me know what your institution is and um, in what capacity you work there? Okay, so we have administrators, we have instructional designers, we have an instructor. Fantastic. Great group. Okay, moving right along. And a manager and a program director. Fantastic. Okay, lots of different perspectives to, um, to engage with today's content. So, in a few words, can you please tell me what was the most unique or most memorable format um, in which you have ever taken a distance learning course? Most memorable or most unique distance learning course? Okay, so um, ones in which there was engagement, um, there was above average faculty presence, lots of inventories, um, says Jackie. And uh, Michael has attended webinars but not um, tried a distance learning course just yet. Well, that's wonderful. So we have a range in that regard as well. So now thinking of the webinars or the courses that you've taken, what did you like in terms of engagement? And I know, Veronica, you've already uh, mentioned faculty presence uh, was something that you really enjoyed. Okay, so we're getting um, critical thinking, problem-based learning, 
Interacting with peers, fantastic. So critical thinking goes back to how the course was designed. Um, so that's problem-based learning. And then interaction goes back to teacher presence, student-student interaction, engaging content, fantastic, interactivity, great. Right, so it's not just read this, watch this, take the exam, exactly. All right, now what were some things that you disliked in terms of engagement? Um, and again, think back to this um, course or webinar series that you had in mind. Dislikes with e-learning engagement. And obviously, Veronica just mentioned, uh, yeah, isolation, lack of faculty presence, no feedback or poor feedback or feedback that comes too late to make a difference in how the student completes the work. Isolation, exactly. You know, while you're typing, I was thinking my first e-learning experience was um, sort of on the verge of middle school and high school, and I took a distance learning correspondence course. Um, and the exciting part was waiting by my mailbox to get my lessons. And then as I would go through the lessons, I would have to find my own resources. And I sort of felt alone. And uh, then I had to mail the lesson back to the instructor. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I would get a response with, yeah, you passed or well, I never got an A, but yeah, yeah, you passed and here's your next lesson and very little feedback. So uh, that's something that uh, was unique um, and uh, part of my uh, formation. Okay, and Michael says that um, occasional limited opportunity to weigh in during presentations and afterwards. Okay, fantastic everyone. So now, um, you've already mentioned some of the themes that come up in the literature. Um, there's problem solving, there's uh, the sense of a community, social presence, teaching presence, uh, motivation, feedback, and much more. So um, if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into the literature, I highly recommend that you use the Quality Matters Research Library. There's a link at the top of the page. It's a live link when you download my presentation. And you can interact with it in two different ways. Um, the lower um, left uh, part of the screen, you can search by standard. And the uh, quality matter standard that has to do mostly with engagement is standard five. Um, it has to do with course activities and learner interaction. So you could select that fifth standard and see what the literature is behind that standard. Or you could use the other side, um, a keyword search, and um, look into something that interests you. It could be engagement. It could be um, discussion. It could be teaching presence. Um, it could be um, any one of the things that we've mentioned in the chat so far. OK. Moving right along, um, there are several ways of engaging e-learning students, and they're all valid. Let's have a look at all of them one by one. First, there is self-paced instruction. Basically, um, the only kind of engagement going on here is between the student and the content, with emphasis being on the content. So it has one star because there's only one level of engagement going on. Next comes Correspondence education, um, which involves the passing of content between a teacher and a student. And I'll use uh, various terms, instructor, teacher, faculty, um, they're all the same. I, I'm not looking at degrees of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> status or anything. They're all the same to me. So. Once again, uh, emphasis is on content, but this time we're looking at two types of engagement, teacher to content, student to content. Uh, there is no direct teacher to student communication. And lastly, our true distance learning um, type is one where the student is at the center, 
Um, it can take place um, synchronously or asynchronously. There's um, the flexibility um, to communicate both ways, perhaps. There's interaction between the student and the content, as was the case with self-paced. So there's the first star. There's interaction between student and teacher. There's the second star. And there is also interaction between student and other students, and that's um, how this earns the third star. So as I was saying earlier, there's validity to each one of these uh, types of engagement. Um, there's a time and place for each one of them. The key here is to set the correct expectations, because if you're taking a self-paced course and you're expecting teacher engagement, obviously you're going to be disappointed. Um, so it's a matter of um, choosing the right solution for the need and having the right expectations. And folks, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to type in the chat. I'll um, keep an eye on that and um, our wonderful moderator, Veronica, is also keeping an eye on that for us. Okay. So as I mentioned, we're now looking at three different types of engagement. And let's go through them one by one. Let's look at some examples, uh, pull some uh, bits and pieces from theory and the literature. And uh, let's begin with student to content interaction. There are two most obvious times when this takes place. At the beginning of the course, you need to as a student, you need to learn how to find your content, how to, how to interact with it. And then throughout the course, you have various learning activities um, that um, call for you to go back to content and get various types of information. Um, a pitfall here uh, that you want to keep in mind and avoid is um, not leaving the student alone with the content. Um, one of our participants, and I believe it was Veronica, was saying earlier that um, read this, watch this, take the exam is not engaging by any means. So we don't want to leave the student with the content 100% of the time. That would take us back to, I don't know, correspondence. Uh, but uh, we do want to um, carefully craft our student content um, interaction. So um, at the beginning of the course, you could consider um, engaging students with the content through perhaps an interactive syllabus. Um, how many times we get a syllabus that's just um, words on a piece of paper, um, sometimes headings are not clearly delineated, and you have to read and reread to try to find essential bits and pieces of information. So. Um, the syllabus is the first um, and most important piece of content for a course. It has to be very organized and, if possible, interactive. And I'll show you some ideas for that later on. Um, another way to engage the student with content at the beginning of the course is perhaps to have a quiz in which you get the student to go back to the syllabus and other key components of the course and find the correct information uh, for instance, you may ask them when certain assignments take place, um, how much uh, certain assignments weigh, and so forth. Just um, highlight key uh, parts of the course logistics and send the student to uh, get them. And you could do that with the quiz, or you could do it with the scavenger hunt, or many other ways. And then learning activities throughout the course. You could um, get students to actively engage with the content, uh, perhaps in creating papers, uh, projects. Um, and then there's also reflective learning. So you could ask students to perhaps keep a learning journal to keep track of what they're taking out of what they've learned, what questions they may still have, how they could implement what they've learned, and so forth. So now let's look at some examples. So um, looking at the um, course orientation piece, so how we get students to interact with the content at the beginning of the course. If your learning management system supports this, personalize your welcome message with the student's name. For example, um, Augusta University uses uh, D2L, or Brightspace by D2L, I believe is their current name, um, and they have a code 
um, that's very simple to use that um, populates the user's name here. So um, depending on who opens the page, their name will appear. Another um, idea is to highlight where the students need to click first upon entering your course. So in this um, example, we're showing them that they need to click on the content box. All right. Next, students get to the first module. And um, some ideas here are perhaps consider having one statement that tells students at a glance what um, the module is going to be about. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to use the arrow, but I don't think I'm doing a very good job pointing. <laughs> Can uh, someone confirm that my arrow is here on the directional icon? It's not. Okay. No problem. Thank you, Jackie and Veronica. I appreciate you. Okay, no arrow. I'll just walk you through the page. Um, and then something else is um, the listing of the outcomes. It doesn't necessarily have to be designer talk. Thank you so much, Veronica. It doesn't have to be designer talk, you know, at the end of this module, students will be able to blah, 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 blah. It could be something a little bit more friendly, such as quickly find the necessary resources that you need to support the completion of the learning activities without frustration, to increase familiarity with other members of the learning community through interaction. So uh, this is an opportunity to form, uh, to start shaping your teacher presence. So. Um, you have the opportunity to make your message inviting. Next, um, you can consider using a checklist that pulls all the elements of that initial module together. Um, and some ideas here are to mention how long um, the completion of this um, checklist is going to take. In this example, we're looking at a checklist that encompasses everything students need to complete for the initial module, and it takes them an hour and a half. Uh, mention a deadline, for example, in this case, midnight Thursday, and then um, show them how to access the checklist. They have to actually click this title to get started. Okay, here is the actual checklist um, in my example. And um, a live orientation is a great way to start a course. Um, it not only um, allows you to answer questions as they come up, but it also helps you establish your teaching presence and to help um, get students to feel like they belong, to uh, feel a sense of community. Uh, I'll point out some other um, aspects. You can um, take the opportunity to create a pre-course survey to get some idea about who your learners are, um, what type of technology they're working with. Um, sometimes there can be an impediment if the technology is not up to par. Um, to try to learn what their goals and expectations are for the course. Um, maybe you could even do a pre-course assessment where um, you get an idea of what students can do at the beginning of the course and then you repeat that at the end and that's your measure of how effective your course was. Uh, of course, the syllabus has to be there. It also helps to pull out the schedule as a separate document that students can print and refer to easily. Weight distribution is another um, common thing that students want to have at a glance. Um, an icebreaking activity is a must. In this case, I'm just using the standard um, introductions. And then here's a scavenger hunt that allows me uh, to get the students to um, go through all of these different parts of the course and then uh, feed back key elements that they've been able to find in the course. So, um, someone whose scavenger hunt comes back with mostly incorrect answers um, gives me the opportunity as the um, instructor to go back and address those uh, misunderstandings to help the student move along. Okay, here's an example of an interactive syllabus. So, um, the interactive elements are 
uh, this table of contents, it allows students to navigate to various parts of the course if they wanted to learn about additional resources. They could um, revisit page 10. Just by scrolling through this menu, they get a quick understanding of what's in the syllabus and they don't have to spend uh, you know, a lot of time and get frustrated because they can't find the information they're looking for. And um, there are multiple ways of navigating. Students can also um, scroll um, with this uh, previous and next um, uh, click here, link. I can't think of the word for it. And they can print the syllabus, which uh, will generate a printout of all 10 pages. If you're interested in interactive syllabi, just Google that term and you'll come up with lots and lots of ideas. Some are super creative um, uses of images and videos, a welcome video embedded in the syllabus, um, lots of different things. Okay, so now let's look a little bit at the theory. Um, let me ask you, can you think of an e-learning course in which the only thing that students need to get out of the course is knowledge? And again, please use the chat box. Is there such a course where students only come to class to get knowledge? I'm getting a lot of silence. <laughs> Wait, several people are typing right now. Okay. <laughs> right, Jackie. Yeah. Um, Lori is saying English literature. Perhaps. Perhaps. Um, okay, Michael is saying it may vary. Veronica is saying maybe intro courses. I basically want to say that if a student wants knowledge, they will not pay tuition to take a course. They will pick up a computer, go to Google, look for the information, or they'll go to the library and get that information, or they'll, they'll go to YouTube and find a video, um, they'll find an app. Um, there are various ways of getting information. Jackie, history, that's true. but. There is a moral to everything, there's a use to everything. What do you do with history? You don't just learn about history, you apply it to avoid perhaps mistakes that were done in the past that we can learn from today. You can perhaps take literature and um, analyze it and then come up with your own, you know, voice as an author and then maybe write your own book or write essays uh, analyzing other people's books. So it's a matter of going through all these different stages and of course you recognize this is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy actually stops at floor number four evaluation. I think later it's been revised but um, I like to think that there is this roof uh, where we have original creation. So one of the common pitfalls is that um, we tend to focus on everything that we need to give the students in terms of knowledge and skills and um, we want to actually do something with that. Once we learn it, uh, we want to be able to use it, we want to analyze it, um, arrange it in different ways, evaluate it, make something with it, um, don't just stop at knowledge. There is no engagement if we stop in the basement. <laughs> So let's challenge ourselves to get the students out of the basement, at least take them to the first floor <laughs> of this uh, proficiency building metaphor that I've created here. And another pitfall could be overzeal, maybe aiming to take the students to the roof just because there is a roof, but maybe it's not called for in the um, uh, design of the course. Maybe students are only um, going to use something, such as, um, I don't know, you learn how to use a software, like Word. You don't necessarily need to analyze it. Um, so depending on, yes, Laurie, tricky question. <laughs> depending on your needs, uh, you will decide how far up in this proficiency building your learners need to go. All right, moving right along. 
Um, another way for um, calling content is inputs, basically what we give students. And, and um, content has to enable students, has to give the students the knowledge and the skills to be able to complete the activities. So content and activities always go hand in hand and they're always tied to the outcomes, basically those uh, measurable, observable behaviors that we need students to demonstrate. And there has to be instructional alignment. So um, whatever technology we use for a module correlates with the needs for um, content, correlate with what the content needs to be, uh, what the assignments need to be, what the outcomes are, the goals, and eventually the course description overall. So content, um, I'm trying to say, is not an isolated component. It's part of a system. It's part of instructional alignment. OK. I'll um, very briefly go through the literature. Um, you can download my presentation and glance at this later. But um, I love Keller. He talks about uh, motivation. And then um, we also want to keep in mind that not everyone has previous experience with distance learning. Uh, one of our participants had experienced webinars but had not experienced distance learning. So when you design your instruction, keep that in mind, especially when you design that initial module. An awesome reading, and I don't have stock in Julie Dirksten, <laughs> an awesome reading for uh, creating um, student-to-content interaction is Julie Dirksen's Design for How People Learn book. I highly recommend it. It goes for about $33 on Amazon. Again, I have no affiliation with Julie. I just I love this book. I find it very useful. All right. Next, let's look at student to teacher interaction. And basically, there are three components to uh, this type of interaction. There is the initial getting started with the course. That's when uh, teacher presence has to be very strong. Um, and also um, two-way communication. Students um, can go to the instructor and say, hey, I have a question. How does this go? When do I deliver this? Um, office hours um, seem to come into play during these peak experiences in the course. The more complex the assignments students have to do, the more likely they'll contact the um, instructor. And then throughout the course, um, providing clear instructions, reading rubrics, and timely feedback. Let's have a look at some examples. So um, here's an example of a syllabus. And to establish um, communication, um, to give students information about how to contact the instructor, there is um, of contact information here. I'm sorry, there's email, phone, and an actual room. But there are also several other options. There is an anytime um, discussion forum where students can ask questions, get answers, and then make friends with the learning community. Why not? There is the traditional um, office hours. In this case, they're handled through Google Hangouts, and they're um, every Wednesday between 1 and 3 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, there's also the opportunity for the students to book a private conference with the uh, faculty member. And I'll go over that in more details in just a second. And as I mentioned earlier, live orientations are a fantastic way to establish your teacher presence and to answer any of those um, initial questions. So here's an example of how um, I personally um, handle bookings. Um, I created this site, and through the site, um, participants in the course can go to uh, this Book Now page. They pick the type of appointment, and they pick the day, time. And then the best part about it is I have the opportunity to take them through an intake form. And with this intake form, I learn about their needs. So when I meet with them during office hours, I have a very clear understanding of what they're looking for, and I may be able to have an answer ready for them, and then we just discuss through the answer. So I recommend that you consider doing this. I don't think this is for everyone, but those of you who are more interested in web development and stuff like that, you may like this idea of uh, um, a, an opportunity for students to engage with you. Um, 
the questions and answers forum is a great way um, to have students mm -hmm. reach out not only to the faculty but also to other students. And um, usually when we see discussion forums in learning management systems, they tend to have these long bodies of text. And what I've uh, tried lately, and I, it seems to go really well, is to have that long set of instructions as a separate document and just link to it. That keeps the experience a little bit uh, neater, a little bit uh, more frustration free. And then um, here's an example of an assignment where um, the outcomes are um, introduced in terms of a mission. So a little bit of mystery, a little bit of a different way of motivating students. Directions are kept very simple, but then the grading criteria are a little bit more detailed. And then um, to keep things on a fun note, instead of having the traditional, you know, you failed, you're successful, you're doing an excellent job, uh, I'm trying something different to use percentages and then to use analogies from sports. You know, you're a gold medalist, a silver medalist, or you're in training. And then since this is a mystery, I'm also providing some clues. Okay. And again, there's um, a little bit of theory. Um, one of the most important things that comes out of the literature is that feedback is very important and it is most useful when it is timely and informative. An excellent reading and once again I have no affiliation with this person I just I love the book. Aaron Johnson has created this um, very skinny book it goes for about eight dollars on Amazon and he has a fantastic way of explaining uh, teaching presence. Um, he's teaching um, high school courses, I believe, but he's talking about universal concepts that apply to just about any type of e-learning. And our last component is student-to-student -student interaction. Um, this peaks at the beginning of the course, you know, getting started, building that rapport, uh, meeting the other people in the course, perhaps keeping in mind who might be a good um, team partner later on in the course. Uh, for instance, if my editing skills are a little bit poor, I may keep an eye out for someone in the class who's a very strong editor. And then if we pair up, uh, I benefit from that person's skills and in return I contribute my skills. So. Um, the beginning of the course is when a lot of the student-to-student -student interaction is going on and then of course throughout the course uh, with the learning activities. If you um, consider creating team assignments for the course, um, also consider providing some resources to the team. Um, typically research shows that uh, most successful teams have a charter and in that charter it's basically like a learning contract among the members of the team. In that con um, charter, they go through um, contact information, communication preferences, a skill inventory, group goals, uh, choice of leadership, um, allocation of resources, plan B, what to do if something goes wrong, and so forth. And another useful thing to provide to students is a team learning log and um, students would use that to keep track of meetings that the team has. The role of the faculty in this would be to guide the team formation, to review the logs and the charter, to outline team tasks, to evaluate teamwork, um, coach the teams in dealing with internal conflict, and enable students to reflect on the learning that's taking place. And uh, the literature says about three to six students to a team would be ideal. All right, so let's see a little bit of the theory here. Very briefly, um, adult learners want their own interests to be reflected in their education, their own life experiences to be included. Um, they prefer to learn together rather than be given information. And then based on the age of the learners, um, you may want to uh, 
provide for differences in the style, time, place, and pace of the learning. And you can read about uh, you can read more about that through Malcolm Knowles um, and his theory of adult learning. Um, when you download my presentation, um, I believe this is a live link. If you have a hard time with that link, just uh, send me an email. But um, this article uh, piqued my curiosity. Um, it claims that the attention span of adults is five minutes. And they recommend that any video lessons be kept to three minutes. So a video lesson of three to five minutes would work best for our um, current generation of learners. Also, um, millennials or generation Y, depending on uh, where you look, you'll, you may see them uh, being used as um, separate terms or as synonymous terms. Uh, they want the content to be relevant. So um, it's important to provide an introduction to any video, to use headlines, and basically to show um, why the students would want to consume that type of content. And a couple of um, thoughts here on student-to-student -student interaction. Uh, most research seems to find that peer review is valuable, um, social aspect is valuable, community is very important, knowledge uh, to be built collaboratively, and so forth. A book that I absolutely love, um, it has 75 ideas for e-learning activities, ways to engage students with their peers. Um, this is a very thick book. It has a good, I don't know, 300 pages. And depending on where you buy it, it can range anywhere from $6 to $90. Um, um, Ryan Watkins uh, graduated from um, the Florida State University um, instructional systems design program and he put together this book for every single activity that he mentions he has basically a lesson plan he has resources I highly recommend this um, you can just flip through it on Amazon and see if it may be something that you're interested in your local library may carry it but um, fantastic book okay so we've come to the end and I'd like to ask you, were there any sparks in this presentation? Um, did we ignite anything? Is there anything you can use right away that we discussed in our presentation? Are there any questions? Please feel free to use the chat box. Let me know what you were able to get from this presentation. Okay, so one question was, uh, what, what I use to create the syllabus, I use soft chalk. I'm typing it in the um, in the text in the chat box. Uh, SoftChalk is a paid application, and it allows you to um, basically put content in that uh, frame that you saw. Let me see if I can skip back to it. If you are patient with me for one second, as I try to click back through. Nope. Nope. Getting close. Okay. Getting closer. Here we go. Yeah, so this is Soft Chalk. And um, they used to sell a desktop version. Now they've only gone, uh, they've gone to the cloud. So the only way you can use it is to purchase their annual membership. A lot of people seem to go um, in the cloud direction. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was. Lori, thank you for the book ideas. Fantastic. Yeah, I wish I would get a commission on those books, but no, I'm just talking about them because I have them on my bookshelf and I love them. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Lori. All right, everyone. If you think of any questions that um, um, relate to this presentation, you can uh, feel free to reach me at glaws at gru.edu. Now, I mentioned that we're in process of um, changing from Georgia Regents University to Augusta University, so at some point I think the GRU piece will go away. But um, I also maintain a website um, where I disseminate information to my faculty clients, and um, you can also find me through there. It's geolawsdesign.com. 
Michael liked the interactivity, um, the ideas for the beginning of the course, ideas for structuring, implementing online courses, taking into consideration learning styles, and the book ideas. Jackie, you're very welcome for the PowerPoint. Thank you, Jordana. Um, Jackie, you can everyone in the audience, I just pushed out to your browser, which should open in a new window, um, the survey for Georgiana's session. Again, if you would take about 15 to 30 seconds to fill that, fill that out, I know she'll appreciate it. And for anyone who came in late, you can click on her file in the bottom right-hand side of the screen and click the button that says download files and get a version of that to your computer. Just follow any on-screen instructions. And we, she still has about roughly three minutes left. If you have any questions for her, we can entertain those. 